Well, good morning again. If you have a copy of God's Word, turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, to the third chapter. A bit unusual on Sunday mornings to, to turn somewhere else in Scripture or f- turn on your app to somewhere else in the Bible. We're going to go into a small sermon series titled, I Need a Break from First Peter. I don't know if anybody else felt led that way, <laughs> but some of you in your heart of hearts, is, you're saying amen and amen. Uh, first Peter, really in chapter 3, very technical and theological in its depth. And for some time, I've had the conviction I want to pray about characteristics of the church. And I want to challenge myself and challenge you what it means to be the people of God. And the first of which we'll look at today is growing, that we are called to grow. We're going to take it up in the Gospel of Mark, the third chapter. Now, in some of the other passages of Scripture, won't, won't be as much as usual, but we're going to turn into the Gospel of John and also turn to the Gospel of Luke. So be prepared for that. In Mark chapter 3, two verses will be the beginning of what we look at for God's counsel for us. In starting in verse 13, it says, And he, which referring to the Lord Jesus, went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired. And they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach. I want to spend just a short time together in worship. I want to remind you of this great truth that you were created to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. You are called to grow in that relationship with him. And as the church, we're to grow together and we're called to worship. So church family, guests, those online, we're called to grow. We are growing I want to explore what that means to grow. So flip over to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. What does it mean to grow? I want to begin here. We'll get to the main preaching points. In John chapter 1, we want to look, start in verse 40, read through verse 42. One of the two who heard John, which is John the Baptist, speak, and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John. You should be called Cephas, which means Peter. So the question, how can we grow? I want to answer that. So the first way in which we can grow is finding the Messiah we've been looking for. Finding the Messiah we've been looking for. The Old Testament issue has always been, can we find the Messiah? When will he appear? What will it be like when he shows up onto the scene? And for Jews, that's always the pastime. Who's going to be the Christ? Who's going to be the Messiah? Now, many fit certain characteristics, but not all of the above. Where's the Messiah? We're we're looking for him. When will he get here? Many thought John the Baptist was the Messiah. It is very natural. This fiery preacher that that preached a repentance, preached a baptism for the forgiveness of sins, repentance. They thought, man... This guy, this guy is the Messiah. And if you can remember what the scripture says, John the Baptist clearly states to them, I am not the Messiah. He says, I am nothing more than the voice crying in the wilderness. It's not me, it's him. I must decrease, he must increase, John says. Now the Christ And Messiah, those are the same word, just in different perspectives, the Old Testament and New Testament. So when we say Messiah, that's really the Old Testament perspective of the anointed one of God. 
And Christ means the New Testament. We're always on the lookout for the Savior. We're always looking for the Messiah. We're always wanting to know who will it be? When will he show up? What will it be like? Now we want the one that's going to come and set it all right. We're always on the lookout. Some of us, we're on the lookout for different things, aren't we? We're always looking. One of my friends who is a North American Mission Board church planner, he and his family were looking for a new vehicle. Have you ever been in that situation? You're online, like, oh, this is a good deal. You got to do your research on that make and model, don't you? How much does it cost? What's the bottom line? What's the interest rate? And if, if you've followed vehicle sales since COVID or you've had to purchase one out of necessity, isn't that a frustrating experience? Supply and demand, the price has been marked up. Does anyone feel like we've been cheated in this situation? So my friend who is a church planner, he and his family, they needed a bigger vehicle because the size of their family. And whatever type of vehicle they're looking at was in high demand and low supply. And so that they would call a dealership and they would say, we're looking for this type of vehicle. And they said, we don't have any. In this metro area in which they live, they're planning a church. They went to the dealership. They found the vehicle. They test drove this vehicle. And when they came back, they told the salesman, we want to purchase this vehicle. He said, someone just bought that over the phone while you were test driving it. It happened that quick. And they found another vehicle. They're looking for one. They found one at a different dealership in a different location before they could go to the location to visually, physically put eyes on this thing. It sold. He sent the word out, hey, could you pray for me? I'm looking for a vehicle. We're always looking for something. Now, in this case, we're looking for the Messiah. Andrew tells his brother, bro, I found him. We found him. The one we've been looking for. From the eons of history, the one to break eternity, he's here. I found him, and I want you to come to him. He's the one we're looking for. We've been looking for him, brother. And he says, I want to bring you to Christ. And when he comes to Christ, he tells Simon, I'm not calling you Simon Barjona. I'm going to call you Peter or Cephas, which means rock. We're always looking for something. Some of us may be seeking fame or fortune. We may be looking for a career path, maybe possessions. But deep down, what we're all looking for is the Messiah. We want to know the one that's going to change our lives. All of us, no matter where we're at, we want the Messiah. We want fulfillment that can only come from God himself, the anointed one of God. This is how you start the growth process. You start growing by finding the Messiah. There's no other way around it. You can't just work your way into Christianity. You can't just say, well, I was born this way. No, you weren't. I don't care what Lady Gaga says, you weren't born that way. This, this week, my son and I went to go purchase something uh, from someone. Uh, and we got to visit with him. We got to witness to him. And I said, well, tell me, where do you stand with the Lord? And I, there was no, let's ease into the conversation. We worked our deal out. We shook hands. There was money transferred. After the, the deal is done, I'm going to hit him with it. Where do you stand with the Lord? I eased into the situation. He said, oh, man, I'm a Christian. I said, great. When did you become a Christian? He said, I've always been one. And I said, no, you haven't. I don't have to be nice at that point. The deal's already done. I already got it loaded on my trailer. He said, no, no, no. What I mean is I was raised in church, so I, I knew the message, and and I said, okay, okay, I want to know, when did you start your relationship? Oh, he goes, oh, not a big deal. When I was young. And we talked about that. 
You see, there's a, a point in your life when you find the Messiah. It just doesn't come about. You don't grow your way into holiness. you got to find the Messiah. And he begins to grow you. I want to question you. Have you found the Messiah? The one we've looked for. The one that, the one that can change you. The one that can help you grow. Turn over to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. We're going to start in verse number 1 and read through verse 11. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gesinnerath. And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them or were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered him, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both of the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you'll be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. After we find the Messiah we've been looking for, number two, how do we grow? Finding myself with the Lord. Shortly after Jesus meets Peter, shortly after that, his mother-in-law is sick with fever. Jesus heals her and she begins to serve. So this is not an unusual context of Luke 5. Where just, Jesus just showed up and And Peter just left, unbeknownst to anybody else. Jesus goes to the Sea of Galilee or the Lake of Gisinerat, whatever you want to call it, and he encounters fishermen. Now, I don't know if you've ever had a fishing trip like this. Nothing is caught. And there are days when you think, I could sell all of my equipment and find a new hobby. It's the same with hunting. The highs are really high and the lows are really low. They've had a a terrible night. And really, this is their livelihood, not a hobby. They caught no fish, but yet Jesus gets in the boat of Peter and begins to teach the people. Then he shifts his focus to Peter. Now, there's, there's an unusual situation here. This is very public. There's lots of people. There's lots of things going on, but yet he focuses on Peter. He focuses on one individual in the midst of many. Jesus instructs all the fishermen, but I submit to you, he directs this exclusively to Peter in a weird way. It's almost Jesus comes in, he teaches, and he says, oh yeah, guys, how did it go last night? And Peter, speaking for all the group, he says, we toiled all night with nothing to show for it. Uh, The word picture of toiled is we are beaten. We are weary. We've done all this work. We get beat up and don't ask us how we're doing. We're tired with no sleep. We got nothing to show for it. Jesus says, If you would just put out your nets into the deep, it'll go really well for you guys. And then Peter says, Jesus, did you not hear what I just said? We worked all night. Don't you think we fished over there? 
Notice what he says. He says, Master, at your word. Interesting that he used the word master. Now, I believe he's already a disciple of Christ. He heard John preaching. He saw his mother-in-law healed. He's been around Jesus numerous times up until this point. And so he says master, which many would say is the equivalent of rabbi, teacher. This is a very respected term. So Jesus says, Peter, put your nets out just a little bit deeper. And he says, all right, Jesus, we worked all night. Master, but at your word. I will put them out. Now, you know, and Jesus says, put your nets out, speaking to the whole group, all the nets. But Peter says, I will do it. Peter knows a great deal about Jesus at this point. He's heard Jesus teach. He just immediately heard him teach. He saw the miracles of Christ. Some were very personal. And he says, I'll put out my nets at your word. And as he does so, He pulls in all these fish. So much his nets cannot contain what Jesus has promised him. Peter no longer calls Jesus master. If you notice in the text, he now calls him Lord. He goes from master to Lord. He goes from respect to a deep reverence, saying no longer are you just a teacher that does miraculous things. You are God. You are my God, and I'm going to walk with you. Peter realize what happened. It's something you and I will experience as we walk with the Lord Jesus. When we find ourselves with him, we grow with him. When Jesus says, I want you to cast it all aside. You say, Lord Jesus, I'm weary. I'm beaten. And Jesus says, I want you to throw it out into the deep. Here's a great application for us. When Jesus tells us to cast it all aside, you think, well, this is my livelihood. I already know what I'm doing. Jesus says, cast it away. Get rid of all your burdens. Throw it all out of the boat and get it out of here because I know what's best for you. And then when you get rid of all of us, all of our intellect, all of our insight, all of our giftedness, and get rid of all of that, and then we can receive the blessings of God. It's only then that we can strive and pull. And when we get rid of ourselves, we find that Jesus has something so much greater than what we could ever imagine. Look at the fish. He tells his friends, you've got to come and help me because the blessing is too great. And only can we find ourselves when we find Jesus. In the text, Jesus says, now, Peter, when you come with me, you're no longer a fisher In ordinary terms, you're going to be a fisher of men. And I didn't put this, I didn't use this text from Luke for for other reasons, but the other gospels record Jesus says, follow me. You follow me. Meaning Jesus speaking to the individual, Peter, says, Peter, you follow me. That's what the text says in the other gospel accounts. Notice what it does not say. Peter, you keep going your way and I'll follow you. You see, we have this weird notion of Christianity that we can go wherever we want to and Jesus is our tag along. We honestly do. Slap a prayer or devotional on it, we're holy, right? I mean, that's why we act in modern day Christianity. Jesus, I'm going to do whatever I want to do and then I want to feel spiritual in the moment. Jesus says, that's not the way it works, Peter. You follow me, that where I am, you're going to be at work. You see, we cannot grow as Christians if Jesus follows us. That's not the way it works. Jesus says, cast everything out, and then you can bring in the blessings. You follow me, not the other way around. You cannot grow if you think God follows you. 
You're not in charge of your life. The moment you surrender to Jesus, you say, I'm going to follow you. You're in charge. Not only do we find the Messiah, we begin to grow as we follow after the Lord and find ourselves with him. Mark chapter 3. Mark chapter 3. Back to where we started. Verses 13 and 14. I should have warned you so you can mark your place. But it's nice hearing the pages of Scripture flip around. It also gives me a, a good idea of when to start. Because if I start while there's pages rustling, it speeds up. And I know when to wait whenever there's a, a good calm. And he, Jesus, went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired. And they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach. Let me give you the third way you're going to grow. It's after you find the Messiah, after you find yourself with him. Number three, you're going to find meaning in life. Only after the first two steps are realized or achieved, You can't find fulfillment in life as a Christian apart from Christ. You can't grow without him. You can't grow without the word. You can't grow without certain aspects. So Jesus called the disciples, the 12, and he called them apostles. The the term apostles means those who were sent out. That's the way the word literally is made. So those sent out, so the apostles... They are known as the guys being sent from their rabbi Jesus or sent from the Lord Jesus. The guys that go around is preaching. Now, we always talk about the apostles the, in the book of Acts, the acts of the apostles, the preaching of the apostles, the ministry of the apostles. But let me, let me backtrack from all those notions we think of the apostles. Before they're known as the ones sent out to preach and to cast out demons, it says in the text, Before all of these things, Jesus said, I want you to come and be with me. When we skip over that statement or that component, we miss everything in the Christian life. God called us to be with him. He said, well, God called me to be a a pastor. God called me to be a teacher. God called me to be a business person. Well, certainly, but not before he called you to be with him. You see, we rush and we try to to put qualities and qualifications upon ourselves when God just says, I want you. I want you to be with me. Come and learn of me. Come and worship me. You see, God wants you to be with him. He wants you to grow, and you can't do that by yourself. Just as Peter handled things individually, it was in the process and the context of many. As Peter followed after Jesus, so too did other guys. And all these many paths led to Jesus, and all these guys found themselves together serving the same Lord, finding meaning. As we intimately pursue Jesus Christ individually, You're going to go after him, have a relationship with him, be with him. And as you find yourself being with Christ, you're going to notice there's other people in your life just like you, wanting to worship Jesus, wanting to know more, wanting to do what is right. And that's what we call the church. One of the characteristics of the church is we grow. I'm not talking about numerical growth. I'm talking about individual growth. It's also a collective growth. We want to know more of Jesus. We want to be closer to Jesus, and so do some other people. And guess what? God put these other people in our lives because we need them. We need their encouragement and accountability. We want them to help us grow. Other than God and his word, the people around you will help you grow closer to Christ more than anything else. It's not a television ministry, which is great, It's not sermons on YouTube, which are great. It's not music on K-Love, which I don't think is great, by the way. That's another another sermon, Pastor Aaron. (laughs) 
We're not getting that started. We think all these things are going to help us, but what help us is others. They're going to challenge us, say, hey, why didn't you come to worship? Why didn't you come to small group? Hey, how's your spiritual life? How's your prayer life? And then they ask us the deep question, how are you doing? You say, oh, oh, I'm fine. No, no, no. How are you really doing? What can I do to help? How can I help you get closer to Christ? What burden can I carry? You see, that's the church. And we find ourselves needing each other. Now, let me dispel any notions of church. This building is not the church. We are the church. When people say, I'm going to church, it drives me crazy. Or they say, oh, we just had church in here. That means that we had worship. You see, the church is the people. It's always the people. When we say it's all about the people, it's all about growth. It's all about us us individually, but it's also us collectively as the church. We want to grow. One of my convictions for us, that I've shared this with the guys on staff, so they're ready for me to preach this and get this out of my system. God wants you to come and be a part of this church to grow. God, in my estimation, which is correct, God does not want you to slip in and slip out. You're not being part of the church. God wants you to come and invest your lives with him and each other. Because God calls you to be with him. And as we are with him, we find ourselves with others. God wants you to grow. Now, in church, there's expectations. I don't want you to say, I'm just a number. I'm just a face in the crowd. You're not. You say, well, I want that in church. Then let me be very humble when I say this. If you want to slip in and slip out with no expectations, no accountability, no encouragement, then this is not the church for you. God calls us to love each other, to invest in each other's lives. That's what being the church is all about. God has called us to grow. And that's our conviction. So let me ask you, have you found the Messiah? That's where we start. Have you found the one you've been looking for? The one that will change your heart. The one that will change your eternity. Are you walking with him? Are you finding yourself with the Lord? Are you walking with him on a regular basis? Have you found your meaning in life? If if we're honest, we'll say it's, it's a work in progress. We don't have it all figured out. We're not the perfect church. I'm reminded of a a story I heard of a man who was stranded on a desert island. Some time had passed, and rescuers came, and they they found this man, and they said, well, show us how you lived while you were alone. And and they came across a dwelling, and they said, what is this building you've built, this structure? He says, oh, that's my church. And they moved a little ways further, and they found another structure. And they said, what is this building? He says, that's where I used to go to church. But I don't go there anymore, though. I didn't like the way I was treated. Find meaning. You're not going to find meaning individually. You're only going to find meaning as you pursue Jesus and find yourself amongst many. We're there to support each other, there to encourage each other, to bear burdens, to grieve, to weep, to celebrate all the ins and outs of life. That's what we're called to do. We're called to grow. And maybe you need to start that relationship with Christ today. It's not through the law. It's not through good acts. It's only through Christ, the Messiah. Maybe you've never trusted in him. Maybe there's some steps of faith you need to take after you've met him in salvation. But maybe you just need to be challenged to come and invest. Maybe today you say, I want to be a part of the church. I want to grow. I want to help others grow. Maybe it's something you, it's not just a simple question you can answer right now, but maybe it's something you need to invest in. Investigate. I want to know what it means to be the church, to be God's people. I want to know what it means to grow. Listen, church, we accept no form of cheap Christianity. We want the real, authentic 
version. And the only way we can accept that is if we grow. If you need to make a decision today, after I pray, come make a decision. Come pray. Pray for others. Uh, Father, we are thankful for your word. We're thankful for your son, our Messiah. Father, as we have seen him in the pages of Scripture, we, we know the truth, and we found the one we're looking for. Lord, may you bless those searching for meaning in him, making him the author and perfecter of their faith. Lord, if someone is not finding themselves with you, if they're not walking with you, not spending time with you, may they see that. May you call them just to be with you. Father, may we find ourselves with you. May we find authenticity. May, may we find meaning but Father, as a church, would we grow closer to you and closer to each other? Father, let us not settle for anything less. Maybe, maybe we be the ones that are called out and made holy. And Father, may we just find ourselves with you. We ask for your blessings on our time, the remainder of our day together in this facility. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.